the Africa, African American Afrocentric history wasn't in magazines and books and literature and advertising. So we're catching up now, but we have so many years of great stories to tell. Pam Greer has shockingly kicked off Prince of Bel Air. Why did it happen? Known for her daring stunts and commanding presence, she was a hero on screen but faced huge challenges off it. Battling personal trauma and a tough Hollywood system that rarely favored black actresses, her career was a fight at every turn. I'll just make enough money in the film industry and then go back to school. Because the people were still very, not, they weren't accepting blacks in very good sound roles. Yet, her abrupt exit from the show left everyone asking questions. What secrets does this reveal about the darker side of Hollywood? Let's expose the real story behind Pam Greer's sudden departure. Pam Greer's revolutionary role in cinema. In a decision fueled by a desire to challenge and eventually change the film industry's status quo, the person chose to accumulate substantial funds through cinema before pursuing further education. This resolve stemmed from the ongoing underrepresentation of black actors in substantial roles. During a period marked by significant barriers for black actresses, Pam Greer emerged as a prominent figure in Hollywood. Renowned for performing most of her stunts, she demonstrated remarkable proficiency with firearms and hand-to-hand -hand combat, captivating audiences, and commanding the screen with her dynamic presence. Her abilities and charisma set her apart and spotlighted her as a trailblazer in an era that offered few opportunities for black actresses to shine. This decision was shaped by the persistent shortage of significant roles for black actors, a reality that will unravel more truths in the chapters to come. Everyone loved watching her on screen. The theater felt like a lively party, but there's more to her story than just the action scenes. She faced violence as a child, had ongoing struggles in her relationships, and was even kicked off the show Prince of Bel-Air. Her journey has been anything but easy. Let's explore the challenges she faced and why she was never invited back to Bel Air. She was born on May 26, 1949, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Her mother, Gwendolyn Sylvia, was a homemaker and nurse, while her father, Clarence Ransom Greer Jr., was a mechanic and technical sergeant in the U.S. Air Force. She grew up with one sister and one brother starting off in the Catholic faith and later being baptized as a Methodist. Her family moved a lot due to her father's military job. In 1956, they moved to Swindon in southwest England, where her father was stationed at an Air Force base. She noticed that, unlike in the U.S., there wasn't much racial discrimination against blacks in Swindon. Instead, the local hostility was directed more towards Germans, which was a big contrast to the segregation and racism they experienced back in the U.S., but this wasn't the worst part. Back in the South, buses ignored them. They were not allowed in certain restaurants, and even as late as 1969, they couldn't try on clothes in some stores. The family returned to the U.S. in 1958, settling near Travis Air Force Base in California, and eventually moved to Denver, Colorado. She attended East High School in Denver, where she participated in stage productions and beauty contests. In 1967, she made a bold move to Los Angeles, California with big dreams for her career. She started by working at the switchboard at American International Pictures. It seemed like a small job at first, but it soon led to an unexpected opportunity. Director Jack Hill noticed her and cast her in Roger Corman's women in prison films like The Big Doll House, Women in Cages, and The Big Bird Cage. These roles launched her iconic career, and she quickly became a key figure in the black exploitation genre of the early 1970s, playing strong, assertive women. Her first major role was in Hill's Coffee in 1973, where she played a nurse seeking revenge on drug dealers. The film's trailer described her as the most formidable one-woman hit squad. It was a commercial success and featured the era's typical mix of drugs and violence. This role made her the first African-American woman to lead an action movie, a significant achievement at the time. New roles and challenges await. The resilient journey of a screen siren. He emphasized her expressive presence and the energy she brought to the screen, qualities that were often missing in other actresses. She continued to star in similar roles in films like Foxy Brown, 
Sheba, Baby, and Friday Foster. However, as the popularity of black exploitation films started to fade in the late 1970s, she found herself with fewer roles. In the 1980s, she began to land more serious parts, playing a drug-addicted prostitute in Fort Apache the Bronx in 1981 and a witch in Something Wicked This Way Comes in 1983. In 1985, she showcased her range as an actress in Sam Shepard's play Fool for Love at the Los Angeles Theater Center. She made a strong return to films as Steven Siegel's detective partner in Above the Law in 1988, and also had a recurring role in the television show Prince of Bel-Air. But her time on that show ended suddenly, adding another challenge to her already eventful career. Sadly, her role in the movie Rocket Gibraltar was cut because the director, Daniel Petrie, worried about how people would react to scenes showing a romance between people of different races. But she didn't let this stop her. She kept appearing on TV shows like Sinbad, Pressed Chronicles, The Cosby Show, the Wyans Brothers, and Mad TV. In 1994, she even appeared in Snoop Dogg's music video for Doggy Dog World. In the late 1990s, she joined the cast of the Showtime series Lynx. She also acted in John Carpenter's Escape from L.A. In 1996, and starred in Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown in 1997, which brought her several award nominations and reminded people of her famous roles in 1970s black exploitation films. Later, she played Kit Porter on Showtime's The L Word, which aired for six seasons until March 2009. She also made guest appearances on TV, including a recurring role on Law & Order Special Victims Unit starting in 2010. In 2010, she appeared in Smallville as Amanda Waller, also known as the White Queen, who led the secret agency Checkmate. The next year, she played a friend and colleague to Julia Roberts' character, a college professor, in the movie, Larry Crown. She found some comfort on her grandparents' farm in Wyoming, where she learned to ride horses, a skill that would help her later in life. Her stutter eventually went away, and she attended Metropolitan State College in Denver with hopes of becoming a doctor. However, life dealt her another blow at 18 when she was assaulted on a date, causing her to withdraw even more. In her memoir, she shared that she had gone through four such attacks. To avoid attention, she started dressing plainly and kept her painful memories to herself for many years, unsure how others would react if she opened up. Her love life wasn't easy either. When she finally confided in a boyfriend about her past, he cruelly called her tainted and left her. This pattern of unstable relationships continued, offering her little comfort. At one point, she dated the famous basketball player Wilt Chamberlain, known for his many romances, but he didn't give her the support she needed. He preferred more refined and polished partners, leaving her feeling alone. Just when she was ready to give up on finding happiness, something unexpected happened. She entered a beauty contest to help pay for her medical studies, not realizing it would change her life. A casting agent noticed her potential and suggested she try acting, mentioning the growing opportunities for black actresses. At first, she was unsure, but she eventually moved to Los Angeles to give it a shot. There, she met another basketball player, Ferdinand Louis Alcindor Jr., who shared her interest in martial arts. They fell in love, and for the first time, she felt understood and respected, marking a new beginning in her life. Big changes and tough choices lie ahead. Love and ultimatums at UCLA. When she moved from Colorado, she was working hard to get into UCLA film school. Around the same time, Ferdinand converted to Islam and changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He proposed to her, telling her she didn't need to change her religion. But over time, Kareem's views changed. He eventually told her that he could only marry someone who shared his faith. She found some of the Islamic teachings about women troubling, especially the idea that women should follow men, which Kareem explained as a divine rule. On her birthday, Kareem gave her an ultimatum. Either commit to him right then, or he would marry someone else by the afternoon. He told her that another woman who was already a Muslim was ready to marry him. She made her decision quickly. She turned him down and wished him well. Kareem then married Janice Brown, 
who took the name Habiba Abdul Jabbar. They had three children together but divorced after seven years. After her relationship with Kareem ended, she threw herself into her acting career, despite the tough beauty standards of the industry. She shared with the New York Times that she had physical flaws like chipped teeth and a scar from a bullet wound. The Washington Post described her as strong and tall, which made it hard for her to get leading roles since she often towered over her male co-stars. But she didn't give up and eventually landed the lead role in the 1971 movie, The Big Doll House. The movie was a hit, though her love life continued to be rocky. She had brief relationships with people like Don Cornelius and Robert Plant. Her most significant emotional connection came in 1973 with comedian Freddie Prinze while promoting her film Coffee. They bonded deeply, and she even considered marriage. But Freddie's worsening depression and drug use became major problems. She recalled times when Freddie showed up drunk, and he even confessed to trying to get her pregnant, which added more strain. Despite all this, Freddie was a big support early in her career, encouraging her to pursue Broadway and never feeling threatened by her success. However, their relationship couldn't survive Freddie's growing issues, and she eventually ended it, although they stayed friends. Freddie later had a child, Freddie Prinze Jr., with another woman, Kathy Cochran. Her friendship with Freddie also introduced her to Richard Pryor, leading to several meetings at his house. But as the scene there became more about partying and drugs, she distanced herself, choosing to focus on her growing acting career. She continued to build her fame through roles in movies like Foxy Brown. But this wasn't the worst part. One night, Freddie, feeling lonely and betrayed by friends over money, called her from a hotel in despair. He told her he had nothing left except a gun, which scared her for both of their safety. So she stayed away. At that time, she was deeply involved in supporting her family managing multiple mortgages and education costs. Just a few days after that call, on January 29, 1977, she got the devastating news that Freddie had taken his own life at just 22 years old. This tragic event brought her back into contact with Richard Pryor as they began filming Greased Lightning. Their professional relationship eventually grew into a romance, but once again, she found herself involved with someone struggling with substance violence. Even so, she remained steadfast in her support for Richard. Her life and career keep evolving. Risks behind closed doors. Richard faced his fears, which helped him improve his health and even encouraged him to start reading and stop using drugs, at least for a while. But after staying clean for six months, Richard slipped back into his old habits. He had been using drugs since he was 13 years old, which means he had been doing so for nearly 40 years. This long-term use took a serious toll on his health. During a routine checkup, she was shocked when her doctor told her that her body had a buildup of cocaine residue. At that time, cocaine use was widespread in Hollywood, and people initially thought Richard might be applying it to his body to enhance his sexual performance. No matter how it happened, it became clear that the cocaine was entering her system during their intimate moments, putting her health at risk. When she asked Richard to use protection, he refused. This refusal was a breaking point for her, leading to their separation in 1977. Richard looked back on these difficult moments in his memoir. He mentioned feeling hurt by her assumption that she was the more famous one in their relationship. Shortly after they broke up, Richard married Deborah McGuire, the wedding was chaotic. Richard admitted he was drunk and Deborah was very late. Strangely enough, Richard was still involved with her at the time. Eventually, she decided to cut ties with him for good. But this wasn't the worst part. As her acting career continued, she started taking on smaller roles in TV shows like Roots and The Love Boat. One day, she got a call from Sidney Poitier, who told her that Richard was causing problems on the set of Stir Crazy because he was high. Sydney asked her to help. When she visited, she found Richard using cocaine but managed to convince him to get back to work. However, things took a turn for the worse when Richard, in a drug-fueled state, poured strong rum on himself and set himself on fire. He suffered severe burns over more than half of his body. She, who had seen him just hours before the incident, chose not to visit him in the hospital. 
a decision she believed Richard understood. Pam came to a painful realization. She couldn't change Richard, just as he couldn't change others in his life. This understanding led her to focus on changing herself, which was a big shift in how she viewed her life. But the challenges didn't stop there. She decided to live a healthier life, starting to run every day and becoming a vegetarian. However, her strength was truly tested in 1988, when she was diagnosed with stage 4 cervical cancer. Doctors told her she only had 18 months to live. The diagnosis was a shock, especially since she had no symptoms before. Her battle was made even harder when her treatment was delayed due to a recent surgery and the trauma from her past. Things got even worse when her boyfriend at the time abandoned her during her first chemotherapy treatments. Despite these overwhelming odds, she managed to overcome cancer and was declared healthy by 1990. In the mid-90s, she moved to Denver to be closer to her family and began a relationship with Kevin Evans, an executive at RCA Records. Although that relationship ended after a few years, she described herself as independent and private in an interview with the LA Times. Her personal life stayed mostly out of the spotlight, except for a long-term relationship with marketing executive Peter Hempel, which ended in 2008. New roles show her lasting impact. The Multiple Facets of Pam Greer Pam Greer's influence in cinema, fashion, and culture is undeniable. She was an icon, beloved by fans around the world. But even though she was a star, her life was filled with dramatic moments. One of these was highlighted during her guest appearance on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, where she played Janice Robertson, the ex-girlfriend of Will's Uncle Philip, leading to unexpected twists in the story. In her new horror series, Greer, the character Dawn, portrayed by Deborah Ayoran, is a Los Angeles police detective dealing with the chaos of 1991 after the Rodney King incident. Dawn is chasing an elimination who leaves behind terrifying crime scenes. Her mother, Athena, played by her, looks after Dawn and her grandson. Athena starts having creepy visions of a monstrous washing machine that may or may not be real. Well known for her roles in classic films like Foxy Brown, she shifts from her glamorous past to play a caring, protective mother. She connects deeply with this role, understanding what it means to care for others and the vulnerability that comes with it. Her experiences in challenging roles have made her a strong actress, always ready to face new challenges. She has experience in the horror genre too, with roles in Scream, Blackula Scream in 1973 and Bones with Snoop Dogg in 2001. More recently, she appeared in Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. She acknowledges that horror isn't for everyone because fear is such a powerful emotion. She admits that she avoids dark, unknown places herself. Reading the horror script was intense for her and she could feel the anxiety building up. The series creator chose her for this role because of her ability to show raw, real emotion, which was essential for playing Athena authentically. Even though she has faced many challenges, she confronts life head-on, revisiting painful memories to make her acting stronger, all while keeping hope and courage alive. But despite her success in Hollywood, she doesn't really see it as home. During the filming in 1991, she lived in Colorado, appreciating the distance from Los Angeles and enjoying her rural lifestyle. Part of this was because she didn't trust the LA police, especially after a troubling incident in the late 90s that made her aware of the prejudices she faced. This experience showed her not only personal risks, but also bigger societal problems. In 2010, she shared her life story in a memoir, which is now being turned into a TV series. It offers a deep look into her rise to fame and the complexities of her famous role as Foxy Brown. As she celebrates 50 years of Foxy Brown, she reflects on her journey from a shy girl to a trailblazing actress who challenged gender norms, inspired by strong women like her aunt. Despite her doubts, her portrayal of powerful women left a lasting impact, making her a symbol of strength and charm in Hollywood. But this wasn't the toughest part of her journey. What do you think about her interactions with Will in Bel Air? As an older character interacting with a much younger Will, do you think it sent the wrong message, especially considering her role as a symbol of empowerment? And how do you feel about her compelling yet difficult life story? Pam Greer's interactions with Will in Bel Air added a dynamic layer to her character. 
Do you think this portrayal affected her image as an empowerment symbol? Like, comment and subscribe for more.